Signore e signori, buonasera. buonasera. Buonasera, benvenuti, bentornati alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. We are very happy that tonight you have a chance to meet our Tiro Senior Professor of Italian American Studies here at Casa Italiana. And let me give you in a nutshell what this Tiro Senior Fellowship is. Tiro Senior is the oldest Italian American club in the United States. It was established here a few blocks from the Casa um, and it still is there. The charter of foundation of the club was signed by Giuseppe Garibaldi's son. And you know, Giuseppe Garibaldi has a statue in Washington Square. And it was basically a club of Italian patriots, of people that felt that it was their duty to take it upon themselves, to take arms, to kick foreigners out of Italy and to unify the country. And there were chapters of this Tiro Senior that literally means sharpshooting um, or target shooting all over Italy to prepare the patriots for their duty to reunify the country. And when the waves of Italian immigration arrived to the shore, there were already members in Italy of this club and they decided to open a chapter of it in the United States. Now, as far as I know, it almost completely disappeared in Italy. In some, in some buildings you see there is still the writing Tiro Segno Nazionale, but there is no longer any club or any people actually going. And it survives in New York. It's one of these interesting things. And it's a very active club, and the club has a foundation. And the foundation does charitable work. And about 20-something uh, years ago, in the year 2000, actually, they decided to establish this fellowship. And the challenge was to bring to academia a fresh breath of scholarship on Italian-Americans and the Italian-American experience on all the different fronts. So instead of uh, hiring one professor, thanks to the donation that we received from Tiro Senior, we are able every other year to hire a professor in a different field of specialty. We had historians, food historians, political scientists, migration historians, literary critics, film critics, and many, many more. And I have to say that to our great delight, uh, the composition of the classes, of the students that take these courses in Italian American studies is the most diverse from a racial and uh, social point of view that you can imagine. The idea was probably, we thought, it's going to be the Italian-American students that study. And since there is a significant component of Italian-American students at NYU, we thought they're going to be the main target. And it is not at all like that. And we found out by seeing the students and talking to them and asking them why they took this course, that the Italian-American experience is not interesting only to Italian-Americans, but it's of great interest to all the other ethnicities that are present in this country. So we have a lot of Latino students, African-American students, students really from any uh, different part of, of American society. Not to mention that we also have the fortune of being able to count on our colleague, Professor uh, Josephine gattuso Handin, that every other year when the fellow of the Tirosegno is not here, she teaches the course on Italian-American life in literature. So we are trying to give our little contribution to the study, the development, the understanding of the Italian-American experience. I would like to thank my colleagues and friends here that uh, do this uh, as their main uh, scope in, their, in the Calandra Institute. We have Professor Anthony Tamburi, who is the dean of the Calandra Institute. Uh, Maria Tamburi, who is the uh, president of NOIA, National Organization of Italian-American Women. And Joe who also works at the, at the Calandra Institute, director uh, of events and activities. They do it, it's their major work. For us, it's like something that we wanted to be part of this department as a choice. Many Italian departments, and Anthony knows it because he spent the first part of his life working in Italian departments, sometimes look down at uh, anything that has to do with Italian Americans. And it's not really Italian, right? It's torcono un po' la bocca. Well, we wanted to send a very clear message that in claiming the Italian American experience as part of the Italian experience, we are sending a message that is not only cultural, but it's also political of inclusion. And not because we want to plant the Italian flag on the head of anybody, but simply because we are saying the Italian experience is what it is because it was declined in different ways in the different parts of the world where these people arrived with their experience, with their culture, with their knowledge. And now, um, tonight's uh, evening is dedicated to the presentation of Massimo Di Gioacchino, uh, Massimo, first and foremost, is a wonderful colleague. This is the second year that he's here. He came on a previous incarnation and he has already taught. The students love him and we, his colleagues, love him very, very much. He's a very serious scholar, very passionate scholar and very passionate professor. 
And the uh, topic of his uh, talk tonight is the discovery of religious freedom, the Italian immigrants in the United States from the confessional order to the First Amendment. Um, Professor Di Giochino is an historian trained at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, that is, as you might know, the most prestigious graduate school in Italy. And he combines a series of different disciplinary uh, expertises uh, that build the unique um, presence that he has in the field. So he combines history, history of the church, history of spirituality, but also history of migration. And he has dedicated the past 10 years of his life scouring, going through archives. He had access for the first time to many documents in the so-called, not anymore, Vatican secret archive. Now the Pope changed the name, right, Massimo? And it's called the Apostolic Archive. No more secrets. There are still secrets, but not officially. So the, the Vatican Archive, archives of the Italian government, archives of the Italian church, but then the archives here in the United States. And one great thing about Massimo, he talks to you about the work that he's doing in the archives, and he makes the work of the historian exciting. Many people think the archive is just a boring dust, and no, it's exciting. And when you talk to Massimo, you understand why that can be very, very exciting. And in the past few years, he has taught American history to American students. Of course, it's a, it's a segment of American history, but nevertheless, it's very, very American history. And he's very proud because he succeeded in making American students love American history, and he's not even American. <laughs> so we are, we are delighted to have him uh, here at Casa Italiana and at New York University. And mm, we are very happy that tonight you have a chance to discover with us what his lucky students are in for when they take courses with him. So please welcome Massimo Di Gioacchino. Good evening, everyone. Buonasera a tutti. Um, being here tonight is both a great honor and pleasure, as well as a unique opportunity to uh, publicly, publicly thank a few people, colleagues and friends. Uh, first of all, I owe a debt of gratitude to the director of Casa Italiana, Stefano Bertini, to John Vincenti, and to all the members of the Tirasino Club, who, for having established this visiting professorship more than 20 years ago. I'm also grateful to the past and present chair of the Department of uh, Italian Studies, respectively Alison Cornish and David Forgesch, who have been extremely kind in helping me prepare for this role. The first time I came here at NYU was in spring 2015. At the time, I was a doctoral student in history at Scuola Normale Superiore, and I came to NYU through an exchange visiting program, uh, which still exists today, to do research in some ecclesiastical archives and to teach a language course. It was a fundamental experience for me, both because it represented a first precious opportunity to teach students, but also because it became the chance to get to know uh, this wonderful community that Casa Italiana is. I'm still deeply indebted to Adriana Bonfield, who you know is here, Laura Bresciani, Nicola Cipani for their mentorship at the time, and I'm pleased today to be able to call them my colleagues and friends. I would like to express my gratitude also to some scholars with whom I had the opportunity to discuss research in recent years and who have been supporting my work with generosity and encouragement. Gianfranco Armando, Kathleen Cummings, William Franklin, Daniele Minozzi, Paolo Naso, Robert Sommery from Columbia, who I know is here, Matteo San Filippo, and Stefano Villani. I would also like to welcome tonight our visiting scholar from Roma 3, Professor Maria Chiara Giorda, with whom we recently founded the Permanent Global Seminar on Religious Diversity in Italian Urban History. And there is more information on the Italian Studies Department website. I would also like to thank Frank Nakbau, director of Fordham University Press, for his interest in the publication of my monograph. Uh, the book will be available in a few months uh, in libraries and on internet with the title The Ruin of Souls, A Religious History of Italian Catholic Immigrants in the United States, 1853-1939. Finally, thanks to those who contributed to realize tonight's event, Julie Canziani, Hesme de Coster, Sophia Moore, and Julian Sachs, and greetings to my students, I see some of my undergraduate and graduate students with whom we are exploring the religious history of Italian immigrants in the United States. Religious freedom, which we often consider one of the basic inalienable rights of the humankind, is a recent achievement of the Western world. 
one of the results of that political order that we call liberal, and which we can trace to the American and French revolutions of the late 18th century. Religious freedom, however, is the product of a longer historical reflection of man, both on the nature of religious faith and the laws of the social contract, which accelerated this debate uh, in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation. Still today, it is a fundamental right in our societies because it relates to the very dimension of sense and meaning, and meaning in our lives of those who believe, but of also those who do not believe. And in fact, religious freedom guarantees not, not only the right to believe and practice any religion, far from the reach of secular governments and religious authorities, but also the right not to believe and to practice any form of religion. The Italians had experienced religious freedom for a few years during the Napoleonic Wars, the Napoleonic period in general. Between 1796 to 1800, the Napoleonic Wars brought to Italy the fruits of the French Revolution, later included in the Napoleonic Code of 1803. As a result of the spread of revolutionary ideals, uh, church property was seized and then sold, civil marriage was established, and the Jews and the Protestants were emancipated. These experiences, however, did not live long, and indeed, with the restoration of the former kingdoms and the political authority of the church in 1815, Italy returned to the confessional order that had existed before. Religious freedom in Italy is therefore the product of the Risorgimento. The first document that guaranteed restricted religious freedom, freedoms, but only in the kingdom of Sardinia in the north, were the Lettere Patenti, the patent letters of February 1848 of King Charles Albert of Sardinia, which emancipated the Valdensians, a protest minor Protestant minority. At the end of March of the same year, civil rights were recognized and later in April accessibility to mil military career was also granted to Jews. More importantly, it would be Article 1 of the Albertine Statute of 1848 on the one hand, to proclaim, to proclaim the apostolic and Roman Catholic religion, quote, the only religion of the state, end quote, but on the other one, to qualify the other, cult, the other cults as, and here a quote, tolerated in accordance with the law. The Albertine Statute became a fundamental law of the Kingdom of Italy in 1861, and Rome became the capital of the new liberal state in 1870. State elites and part of the urban bourgeoisie embrace the new liberal culture, and at the top of the state, throne and altar, that is, political and religious power, became partly independent. In Italian cities, a strong anti-clerical culture marked the urban space with ideologically charged historical documents, monuments, sorry, such as the statue to the heretic Giordano Bruno in, Campo di, in Piazza Campo di Fiori in Rome. However, in rural areas, Catholic culture often remained the only cultural reference of the masses, threatened in part and only later by socialist and anarchist cultures. Local civil officials continued to refer to parochial authority at several levels, and among the masses, sin and crime remained synonymous. Moreover, not only did the Catholic Church continue to exercise a political and hegemonic role, especially in those territories from which the immigrants would emigrate, but it proclaimed the liberal order one of its main enemies and rallied the masses against it. Indeed, in the encyclical Quanta Cura of 1864, Pius IX condemned, among other ideas, freedom of religion, separation of church and state, secular education, civil marriage, and any doctrines of popular sovereignty. In 1874, Pius, Pope Pius the, uh, the, the Ninth forbade Italian Catholics to participate in the political life of the new liberal state by either voting or getting elected. For the millions of Italian immigrants who arrived in the United States between the late 19th and early 20th century, religious life in the American metropolis referred to a new, totally new model of society. As soon as they arrived, even the poorest and most illiterate among them would soon experience, without necessarily being able to conceptualize, the absence in the United States of this confessional order based on the monopoly and privileges of the Catholic Church and on the political role of its clergy. 
In the United States, the absence of a hierarchical and clerical church was not filled by another form of confessional monopoly, but was re replaced by the presence of a public and free religious life, the result of that great juridical revolution, which is the first amendment to the Constitution, and of that culture of separation of church and state that had flourished earlier in the colonial era. It was just enough it was enough just to walk through the little Italy's of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, or as well as, uh, as well as other American cities to realize the existence of this different order. At the beginning of the 20th century, an Italian immigrant residing in the little Italy of East Harlem, Italian Harlem, today Spanish Harlem in New York, and here it is, um, an Italian immigrant could find within a few miles the Catholic parish of Our Lady of Mont Carmel, the Methodist Church of Jefferson Park, the Ascension Presbyterian Church, and the St. Ambrose, uh, Ambrose Episcopal Church, all of whom having missions for Italian immigrants and in part competing uh, with each other to assist them. In the Washington Square area near us, uh, an Italian immigrant could, find, could attend the Scalabrinian priest, uh, parish of Our Lady of Pompeii or the Franciscan St. Anthony of Padua, but also the Baptist Judson Memorial Church, the Washington Square, Square Methodist Church, and the epo uh, eponymous Broom Street Tabernacle Church. The same was true for the Little Italy's of South Philadelphia, the North End in Boston, um, the near north of Chicago, and other smaller cities throughout the United States. And then, just by venturing a little bit further, they could discover the reality of Jewish neighborhoods, such as the Lower East Side where synagogues and rabbinical schools stood free, and where the Jews, not confined to the ghettos as under the papal states, lived a rich and vibrant social life. This public freedom created an unprecedented religious market for the Italian immigrants, unconceivable in Italy, and characterized not only by the freedom to join this or that religious confession, but also to make a career as a minister in the various denominations, or to enjoy the services of the institutions they managed, Sunday schools, sewing schools like this one, workshops, English, English classes, employment centers, medical clinics, and so on. Over the years, these institutions thrived and spread. In 1917, in the United States, there were, there were not only 150 Italian Catholic churches and missions, uh, but also 107 Italian Presbyterian churches, churches and missions, 87, 82 Baptist churches and missions, 60 Methodists, 44 Congregationalists, 24 Episcopal, 3 Reformed, 3 of the Evangelical Association, for a total of 326 Italian Protestant churches and missions. All told, the American Protestant denomination spent more than $227,000 annually, employing 201 ministers and pastors to assist and evangelize the Italians. In 1934, Presbyterian minister Henry Jones stated that in the United States, there were 25,731 official members of Italian Protestant churches and about 100,000 believers, 30,000 uh, only in New York. In the same year, according to what he reported, there were about 60,000 Protestants in Italy, making the Italian Protestant community in the United States larger than the one in the motherland. There is no doubt that New York, in the 1920s, the largest Italian city in the world, more populated than Rome, Milan, or Naples, represented the social laboratory par excellence of this unprecedented experience of religious freedom. Except for the very first Catholic church in the United States, which is St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi in Philadelphia, which was founded in 1853, the first Catholic and Protestant churches were founded in New York. A large number of priests, ministers, and pastors worked there. And even many other missionaries and ministers who subsequently worked in other states were educated there. New York was home to religious periodicals and the religious literature in Italian, Bibles, hymns, treaties that educated Italian immigrants read was also printed there. It was behind the entrance door of those evangelical churches that Italian immigrants would discover and heretofore unknown, ferocious, and ruthless criticism conducted both by Italian and American ministers 
aimed at the papist and clerical religious culture that many of them had known in Italy as the unique model of public religious life. Indeed, the Catholic faith of the Italian immigrants made them unwanted to a large part of American society. In the eyes of many Americans, the Romanism of Italian immigrants not only referred to a monarchic and theocratic vision of religious life, which had always been in considered incompatible with American life, but appeared to be a particularly serious threat in the decades following Pope Pius IX encyclical Quanta Cura and the Italian unification. If the American constitutional order on the one hand offered religious freedom um, towards arriving immigrants, on the other it required allegiance to that culture of the Republican Pact founded on the full separation of church and state and so revealing itself as an inclusive but also an exclusive device. This criticism which immigrants were exposed to in different ways and to different degrees was accompanied by the discovery of the Bible, whose direct reading was discouraged, if not forbidden, by the Catholic Church at the time. Instead, in the America, the Bible was translated into Italian and distributed free by American public uh, biblical societies. Over the years, numerous Italian religious periodicals were published, such as the Presbyterian Lera Nuova, the Methodist La Rivista Evangelica, the Baptist Il Cristiano, the Unitarian Presbyterian La Evangelico. Once available, this material will then circulate in Italian churches or be sold on the streets by the colporteurs, that is, by those street vendors of Bibles, books, and evangelical pamphlets that had also appeared in Italy after the capture of Rome, the breach of Porta Pia of 1870. In the United States, they tried to spread religious literature in Italian in those places where Italian immigrants flocked, such as streets and markets. Unprepared for the reality of American religious pluralism, Italian immigrants often had difficulty in deciphering the architectural, symbolical, liturgical, and especially theological differences between the several American denominations. In this regard, we know that some, Ita uh, some Italian immigrants attended Protestant churches without knowing it, entrusting the diversity of the cult to American customs, or that some women opened their door to the Methodist diaconesses who presented themselves as Christians, thinking they were Catholic missionaries. To complicate matters, some Protestant pastors attempted to approach Italian Catholics by proposing liturgies and symbols that were familiar to them. For example, in 1891, the Diocese of Brooklyn reported to the Archbishop of New York, Michael Corrigan, that in a Protestant church in Mulberry Street, in Manhattan, not far from here, the pastor was dressed as a priest and deliberately carried out a liturgy very similar to the Catholic Mass. And here I quote, I've also given my attention to the Mulberry Street Church where they met Lord Pace. Poor Italians, I think they're being misled, sadly misled. Their faith is being stolen from them. It appears to me that a considerable amount of harm is being done and that the affair deserves some consideration. Would you believe that Pache was clad exactly as our priest in a black cassock, that he pretends to say mass using a liturgy which is merely a translation of ours? There is no doubt, indeed, that the religious diversity of American cities was a cause of disorientation for Italian immigrants. Journalist Amy Bernardi referred to what she perceived to be, quote, soul trafficking, end quote, conducted by means of, and here I quote her again, sermons, insinuations, conversions, end quote. A source, in her negative opinion, uh, of, quote, imbalance, restlessness, and discontent among Italian immigrants. And certainly, imbalance, restlessness, and discontent emerges in the reports of some Italian immigrants, like the following one, of an Italian who had just landed in New York. And here I quote, this is the immigrant sp um, speaking to a Catholic missionary. I obtained my work on my arrival, on arrival in New York. Some kind people brought me to a missionary who I believed to, I, whom I believed to be a priest. He gave me hearty welcome. He promised me employment if I had been a faithful Christian and attended church. The following day I went to work. On Sunday I went to the church assigned me but when I knelt down and I saw that our Lord was not on the altar, that no image or picture of the Madonna was to be found there, I understood at once that I had been deceived. I arose weeping and said within myself, I will die of starvation rather than deny my faith. 
This is why I am now without work. The continuous migration of Italian immigrants from one area to another of the city of American cities and within the country made this situation, this religious market, dynamic and constantly changing. To grasp this, they only had to observe the sacred buildings of the city, which in fact were erected, destroyed, transferred, or whose affiliation was changed with ease depending on the needs, all to the great astonishment of the Italian immigrants who had been accustomed to considering the sacred building a fundamental, a permanent element of the urban landscape. The situa this situation made it difficult even for the most cultured Italians to navigate the urban landscape. Priest and intellectual Emilio Pasteris recounted that once he got lost in Lower Manhattan where he was searching for a Catholic priest, friend of his, and he entered a Protestant church by mistake. And here I quote him. Stuff is this which alone expresses the religious dangers and which happened to me while in downtown New York, the labyrinthine low city of New York, I was looking for a Salesian father who was my acquaintance. In place of the church where he was staying, I entered another one. Uh, not far away, and of similar proportions enough to confuse, and had been a fresh and, and had seen a fresh and elegant young priest coming towards me, with two large eyes humbly lowered, smiling. When he politely led me to the sacristy and ask, I asked him about my father friend, a well-known name, he renewed his smile and looked at me while the sacristan approached and noticed all the words. Uh, and here is the what he perceived to be a priest. Perhaps you're wrong, he told me in a beautiful in Italian accent and a little blushing, a little blushing. This is not the church you're looking for, but a Protestant church. And as I looked in the amazement at his cask Kassok, who repelled with the tranquility of his words, he added, in fact, have not known the truth for a few days and have embraced it. I hope well that in a few months I will be a minister of the new church. Who oh, could all come to the truth? There was no doubt. A terrible pain hit me. But have you really studied hard to come to the truth? I couldn't help telling him, getting up. I studied at the Gregorian, the Pontifical Gregorian University, sir and I'm from, and we don't know. Many of the ministers who worked in Protestant churches had, in fact, previously been Catholic priests. And for this reason, they were often considered by Italian Catholic communities as traitors to their own church and people, and morally corrupt if married. Their conversion, especially if it took place in the United States, risked being dragged along with controversy and slander. The Valdensians knew this well, and at the time in Italy, they refused to accept former priests for the ministry, recommending them rather to teaching or writing. This contempt was also shared by educated members of the Italian community, not necessarily affiliated to the church, such as the aforementioned journalist Emmy Bernardi, and here I quote her. And above all, it seems to me the, it seems uh, to me to be ignoble and repugnant the attitude of those Italian converts, you can read renegades, often Catholic priests, destitute and tares, who have made a deal out of it, who attract and persuade the villagers, so much that if a pseudo-intellectual barely able to speak off the cuff in Italian and make himself understood in English, no longer knows what saint to turn to, he always has the resource of securing his bread by an appropriate conversion then exploiting, of course, convertendi, those who are, in going, are, uh, are getting converted, converters and converted. Although Catholic sources presents, present the choice of the evangelical ministry among the Italian United States as a comfortable and convenient choice, it actually involved numerous difficulties. Many Italian ministers lived in a kind of limbo. On the one hand, by residing in the Italian neighborhoods where they operated, they experienced daily um, the contempt of the Catholic majority and his anti-Protestant prejudice. On the other, in the rest of the society, as well as in, in the American denominations to which they belong, they experienced both religious and racial anti-Italian prejudice and the difficulty of interacting into, to integrating it to a new society. Furthermore, being a Protestant minister among Italian immigrants was a more 
uh, uh, was a more difficult task than many thought because it did not focus only, only on the pastoral care of the souls, as it was the custom in the Catholic Church, but also on the concrete and material needs of the immigrants. This was the working principle of several Protestant denominations, ready to assist Italian immigrants in the search of a job, as well as a home, in getting a bank loan, as well as a school to send their children to. This approach emerges in the reports on the work of Protestant pastors, such as Damiano Rossi, pastor of the First uh, Methodist Church of Corona, Queens, New York. Mr. Rossi serves as a pastor, builder, and a businessman. He gives financial advice in addition to spirit and counsel. He's a guide to his people. When a family moves into the community, he calls on them and urges them to buy a home instead of paying exorbitant rents. He knows that homeowners make a permanent community and a permanent church. He helps new families find desirable desirable houses and aids them to obtain banking credit. There is no doubt that behind the reasons for some Italian immigrants converting to Protestantism were the material needs rather than the greater uh, than great theological insights. In the condition of extreme poverty and hardship they experience, they learned to use this religious market to their own advantage. This was a constant theme in the anti-Protestant propaganda in the Little Italy's, which viewed the work of the Protestant denominations as a threat. And here again, Emmy Bernardi. A Baptist quote, a Baptist pastor in New York dared to qualify this state of affairs by expressing the opinion that if we had enough money, all the Little Italy would become Protestant. Now, and I say this with the free conscience of one who is not moved by any narrowness of conviction or on the other hand, by any, uh, any personal intolerance. The ignoble and criminal opinion of the Baptist pa pastor and his fellows should be thrown back in his throat. The same ethnic and historical reasons that allowed and still allow uh, skepticism to flourish in Italy, but did not succeed in making it Lutheran with Luther, who had, been so much more, who had so much more ingenuity than his posthumous followers, nor after Pope Leo the, uh, the X, who had it, however, still more than Luther, they are also valid today in our immigrated world. Let the Methodists establish their clubs by subsidizing individuals, families, bands, and schools, providing families with milk, coal, coal, oil, clothing, maintaining health or vacation homes for mothers and infants, and so on. It is no less true that such pers persuasions is not always enough and that they often find themselves having to disguise the reason for their generosity. Religious freedom, Italians would discover, also meant responsibility and participation. In fact, American citizens, educated in the full spirit of the separation of church and state, were constantly called to participate and contribute, even economically, to the uh, sustenance of their own churches and uh, ministers. This culture of giving, as many American, Americans called it, was unknown to Italian immigrants. Centuries of clericalism had in fact taught the immigrants that, and here I quote what uh, a, an immigrant said in one, of, uh, in one of the letters preserved in the Archdiocese and Archives of New York, quote, the church had to give to them, not them to the church. In other words, for many Italian immigrants, the management of ecclesiastical life was a matter of the clergy, not a public matter. We respect to this culture, there were numerous attempts by Protestant ministers or Catholic bishops to encourage Italians to contribute financially to their churches. For example, in January 1889, Archbishop of New York, Michael Corrigan, issued a pastoral letter addressed to the Italian immigrants in which he wrote, we exhort you to correspond to the efforts of the priests who have come to us and to the well-known zeal of all the others who work hard for your souls. As regard to the churches of the cities, the city where Italians received their spiritual aids, four of them have been either erected or placed at your disposal by other Catholics already established in New York for some time. But the last two are the work of your generosity and devotion, which gives us hope that as your means grow, you will be able to sustain your churches by yourselves. As far as we are concerned, we warmly exhort you to this beautiful and at the same time, most holy word. 
uh, the ants that you will give for the house of your God will return to you a hundredfold. In conclusion, there is no doubt that the possibility of converting to one or another religious confession did not result in a denial of their own Catholic traditions and their own peasant culture in the large majority of the Italian immigrants. Yet, the contact uh, Italian immigrants had with American religious freedom gave birth to an important chapter in Italian religious history in the United States, characterized, among, among other things, by an unprecedented cir circulation among the Italian communities of certain modern ideas, full separation of church and state, religious freedom, secular public education, among others, and by a context of pluralism and religious diversities in the Italian communities that Italians would experience in the peninsula in Italy only starting from the 1970s. Furthermore, and I believe this is one of the research teams for the next five years, the experiences Italian communities had in the United States did not stay overseas, but returned to the Italian peninsula, and especially to the south of Italy, to re return migration of many Italians. Methodist Ita Eduardo Tagliatela wrote of quote, humble workers and farmers who emigrated to America and converted there to the faith of Christ. Reformation, Protestantism in his views. And I continue quoting, who returned to their homeland, Italy, to make propaganda among families and friends. At the beginning of the 20th century, some Italian immigrants founded important churches and started an evangeliz evangelization process in central and southern Italy. In this regard, and here I end, Alberto Pecorini wrote in a celebratory, a celebratory tone, in Southern Italy and Sicily, and this is 1906, in Southern Italy and Sicily live perhaps 200,000 people who have found themselves in a more or less intimate contact with American life and who have left Italy with, with their minds cluttered by superstitions and intolerant ideas and returned to it, to Italy with their minds open, free, prepared to rise to them or to lead their, and, or to lead their children to a more, more modern and truer civilization. Thank you so much. I, I think we have time for discussion. I have a microphone here and there should be one somewhere. Stefan, you want to ask? Thank you for your talk. Human history has been replete with persecution uh, of one group against another, uh, committing atrocities uh, all throughout history, burning of heretics and people they don't agree with, burning of Jews and First Nation indigenous people. So I don't understand how the term religious freedom can be utilized in any meaningful sense because Freedom of religion means freedom of thought and freedom to believe as an atheist. So could you please clarify? I'm really confused by your talk. By the talk or by the title? What? By the talk or by the title? I'm confused by his talk and I'm confused by the philoso philosophical term religious freedom because all I see is lack of uh, religious freedom. With, given missionaries that went all over the indigenous people forcibly converting them and take, robbing them of their own culture and their own beliefs. So I'm thoroughly confused. Um, um, I, would, I would just say that I focused on Italy and the US, late 19th century, early 20th. No, the term religious freedom. I'm not, yeah. I mean, you used that as an ideal at the beginning of your talk, religious freedom. Yeah, so I'm saying that is not a tenable moral or philosophical term, given the reality of human history. Uh, human history, human, political orders has, have had different degrees of religious freedom. And so you on, we have had experiences and uh, political orders based on religious intolerance and all the, all, every, all the phenomena that you mentioned, persecutions, 
and so much more. So that exists, but I would say you, you, or you live, or at least today you are here in a city where, we, where, from, uh, where at least today, but this is true uh, for much of the 19th century as well, uh, different religious confessions have been um, existing and living together. Of course, I would say there, is the, there are no absolute in here, so every, uh, every social system has a certain degree of tolerance and uh, is some, might be somehow intolerant to certain groups, there is no doubt, but as historians we can, uh, we can uh, trace and go back to facts, and so we can, we can realize that, for example, then this was well, the space. Well, I'm not seeing religious freedom anywhere in this group. I, I, I guess I can't help <laughs> like, with that. Uh, it's, it's not a category that Professor uh, Di Giacchino invented, I have to say. I'm sorry. No, I think it goes back to, yeah. it, it's, to the case. It's no, a category case, that exists. Then we can say, we have struggled to achieve it, have we achieved oh. it or not? But there's an idea of freedom of religion and freedom from religion. It exists, it's a thing. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you can quantify, percentage-wise, the number of Italian immigrants who actually became Protestant, because I, growing up in the true faith of Congregationalism myself, uh, <laughs> I, I did know a very, very few Italian of Protestants, course. but very few. So I'm just curious. It's, it, it was a re revelation to me to s to see this presentation. So I'd be curious to know if, it's, if there's a way to quantify it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad it was a revelation to you because it means that I've done some, at, at least uh, somehow original work because it, it proved to be a revelation and it is a revelation to many Italian Americans, to many Americans who tend to think, the, tend to look at the Italian religious, uh, religious history in the United States through the lens of some uh, categories and certain stereotypes as the S little southern villagers from the south who is uh, only Catholic. And I have given statistics somewhere, and here they are. So in 19, so, so there has been a growth, and this also is this also truth, not only because Italian immigrants have continued to arrive at, at least until 1921, 24, but then they had children, and so sometimes they are, they, their second and third generations are counted in these statistics. So of course, this is why the numbers go, uh, go up. Uh, in 1934, there were 25,731 official members of Italian Protestant churches. So 25,000. Um, um, and in 1917, they were about 15,000. So uh, 20 years later, less than 20 years later, there were uh, 10,000 more. Okay. I would say, so again, if, if speaking of churches, institutions, instead, in uh, 1917, there were 326 Italian Protestant churches and missions. In the United States. In the United States. Most of them, New York, Boston, as I said, Philadelphia, but you can find them, and there are some statistics on, on this, you can find Italian Protestant churches everywhere in the United States. You can find them in Florida, in Louisiana. Italians accompany the, the westward migration during the second half of the 19th century, and you have Italian missionaries, Italian evangelical communities in, uh, in Idaho, you have them in Colorado, of course, less than New York. Yeah, absolutely. The question was percentage-wise. Um, it is. So it, it's got to be just a few percent. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, at the same time, not all the Italian immigrants were Catholic. Ninety-five percent of them declared themselves Catholic while entering New York uh, at Ellis Island. But we know that a third, sometimes twenty-five, twenty percent of them, somehow attended Catholic churches. And so it is hard to speak. So while it is, we can, we can speak in terms of, of religious affiliation, then it is hard to, uh, to quantify how, how, 
what percentage of immigrants really attended Catholic churches, Protestant churches. And again, it is, it, it is the whole issue is dynamic because Italians constantly moved. They moved within New York, within New York State, they went west, they started going to New Jersey actually from day one, uh, from late 19th century. And so, and so communities are built, communities dissolve, churches are temporarily erected, and then chapels are opened somewhere else. So it is, everything is very dynamic. Yeah, uh, if, if either of you are going to make comments related to that last point, though, you can. No. All right. Um, so. Yeah, can, can you take a microphone? Thanks. Um, professor, thank you very much for your talk. It was great. Um, my family is very, probably very typical of uh, Italian American immigration. They came over around 120 years ago and um, w from the south, of course, and then landed in the north here, so it's kind of this mismatch. Um, and I'm wondering, I, wa you know, I wasn't expecting your talk to focus so much on the Protestant issue, um, and I'm wondering if you've, if you've l had a chance to look into these larger things of like, for example, when I started going back to Italy as an adult, it seemed to me like the people I knew here were more Catholic in some ways than people I met in Italy, and that Italy had, you know, the churches in Italy were kind of empty. And a friend of mine from Rome, she came to visit my family here in New York, <laughs> and she said, you know, Michael, your family is more like living like Italians did 100 years ago. And it was like a lot of Italian Americans from the South, especially, I don't think they realized that Italy has kind of moved forward, or at least for a long time didn't, maybe they do now. And so I'm wondering when you are in your um, exploration and your investigation, what are these larger t trends of religious freedom beyond just this Protestant s story, which is really fascinating, but the idea of people moving towards, you know, completely other religions, Buddhism, and then even becoming atheists, or in, and in both the parallels in both countries, uh, you know, I'm curious about anything that you might want to add. Yeah. I guess the, the word you might want to use is secularized. Mm -hmm. Somehow Italy s is full of churches, but uh, Catholic s culture seems to be more secularized than the one in the US. So American Catholics sometimes seem more Catholic than Italians. Uh, we could tackle this issue from many po uh, perspectives, I guess. But I would say the very difference uh, between the Italian and American context is that in, um, in Italy, the church, the Catholic church, as, as I was mentioning at the beginning, opposed uh, the creation of the liberal state, the new rising liberal culture, which eventually spread everywhere in the Western world and even, not, even beyond the Western world. And so somehow the church in Italy got delegitimized in the late 19th century, early 20th century, got delegitimized because did not support uh, reinforced, did not lead, did not lead the unification movement and the uh, the spread of modern life, but it opposed it, and somehow it got it, it lost uh, legitimation for it. And so there is no doubt that in late 19th century, early 20th century, a large part of Italian society starts voting socialist. That socialist anarchist cultures spread, um, and so. While in, in, while in America, uh, the American Catholic Church has always been somewhere in between Rome, the official uh, the theological, political strategy and position of the Holy See, and American bishops who have been um, ready to uh, uh, get acquainted, to come into terms with American life, American constitutional orders. And so somehow earlier, somehow, even from the Ameri American Revolution, the American Catholics have supported the American experiment and they have eventually benefited from the, um, the spread of American influence. So the, Amer the Catholics in the US at a certain point have been able to claim to be fully Catholics, fully Americans. And this is probably, today many Catholics are notably, not all of them, but a large part of the Catholic electorate have turned conservative, right. Um, again, in Italy, 
this has not been possible, which is, for a long period, being Catholic and Italian has been in opposition in terms. And so, eventually, a large part of Italian society has supported, enjoyed, has ha uh, took benefits from the creation of the liberal state, and the church got legitimacy. Not for speaking, without uh, keeping outside of our discussion, the, uh, the cooperation between church and fascism from from in the 1920s, 20s, and 30s, which also delegitimized even further. Mm. Uh, and, so, and so if churches are empty in Italy, there are many reasons. I'm not here to give one explanation for all, but there is no doubt that the church has been politically delegitimized for its opposition. This is not the case in America. I'm sorry, if I, I'm sorry, if I just make one more quick comment. Um, it really resonated with me when you talked about this phenomenon of the superstitions, especially from people from the South, and their superstitions grounded in their beliefs in Catholicism being questioned. Uh, my father was born in 1929 in East Harlem, and his mother, my grandmother, had all these really, <laughs> what seem today, crazy <laughs> notions about things like turning saints upside down, statues <laughs> of saints, all these things. And of course, with my father, he grew up Catholic, but being an American, and getting a you know a public school education and everything, he was able to question these things. And just seeing in one generation that phenomenon in my own life, I, your talk really resonated. So thank okay. you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation here today. Um, I think as a number of audience members have said it's a kind of revelation for them to even even begin to think of Italian immigrants as not being Catholic, um, this kind of almost um, hegemony of this one sort of narrative. So that's been really refreshing. I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the Catholic Church's reaction, um, and you, you alluded to it a little bit, but the Catholic Church's reaction to this prosel Protestant proselytization. And, and I'm thinking in sort of tr in terms of two things. One is that, at least especially in the United, especially in New York City, the Irish-dominated Catholic Church had just barely begun to Americanize the Catholic Church as these Italian immigrants are coming, and that they are bringing with them certain kinds of public practices um, that the Catholic Church and the Irish-dominated Catholic Church finds um, uh, sort of difficult, yeah, I mean, the idea that these things are superstition, that they're pagan, et cetera, instead of being part of people's belief systems, but that it presented a uh, problem for them, the Catholic hierarchy, in sort of making the Catholic Church uh, okay for American society. But coupling with that, with that real fear of this Protestant movement into the Catholic Church, I'm curious about like how rigorous and forceful the Catholic Church was in combating Protestant proselytization. Okay, uh, thank you for the clearly interesting question. Um, um, so, as 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 you were mentioning, uh, American bishops had to manage the presence of Italian immigrants. On the one hand, they tried to integrate them into American churches because they knew that American Protestantism was particularly strong in that period. This is, this is the uh, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, American denominations are powerful, uh, extremely wealthy institutions, able to spend money to convert the Italians. And so bishops have a political mandate. They, have, they are asked by the Holy See, by the popes, and there is correspondence. The popes have been involved constantly in these affairs, there is documentation about this. Uh, so they have a mandate, they have to keep them Catholic, they have to bring them to the churches. But, as you were perfectly mentioning, the, the Irish, Irish dominated church was not willing to accept them as they were, mm -hmm. as they were. Um, and so it, so it tried to, in, to, to keep them inside the boundaries of Catholic life, but always at somehow distant. Uh, and the, the, if we want to um, visualize what this strategy would mean, this is the so-called um, um, parochial model of the annexed parishes. And so if 
some of you might know the Transfiguration Church, which is in Little Italy, near East Broadway. I think it's Mott Street. Today is an Asian, a Asian Catholic Church. It used to be one of the first Italian Catholic, it was one of the first Catholic churches where Italians flocked. It was an Irish church managed by an Irish pastor. Irish would, would have mass and men have their own social life in the real build, in the real church, the upper floor. Italians would pray, meet in the basement. Different modern moments uh, with different pastors. And so the annexed parish was a way to, to, to work this both strategy. We, we, we include the Italians, but, and there are very, uh, sometimes very specific, we can say silly reasons why Irish congregation didn't want them, and they are dirty, they, 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 smell. they smell. Sometimes it, it's re, it's re also relates to these very basic reasons. Okay, there is not always high politics. So, um, so it's many times Irish people don't want to accept them, I would say based on a discourse on, on race, on class, uh, and so the annex parish is the way they work. And then the national parishes. So they, are, they, go to, they go to a Catholic church, to a Catholic parish, but it's their own. And so we, are, we Irish Catholics are fine because they have their own church, but they have to pay for it. And one of the first uh, international parishes is indeed Our Lady of Mont Carmel, which is close on Carmine Street, founded by the Scalabrians. So there have been several more, but the, I would say the strategy was this, to include them, to educate them, to police them, so please, no processions. Of course, the Italians would carry them otherwise, anyway. <laughs> but there is an effort to include, to keep them far, and to police them on so many different levels. Again, in terms of liturgy, in terms of uh, economic contributions, and so much more. Um, I'm going to stop here, but there will be, so, of course, so much more to say. Massimo, generally, first of all, thank you for, for a brilliant talk, and I'm so grateful to have you in the department, and we can have these conversations basically every day. Um, but the, from the picture that you uh, gave us, that you presented to us, the, the history of early Italian immigration and, and religion is a history of defeats of institutions, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Protestants, despite the spasmodic effort to convert the Italians, both in Italy, that is a disaster, because after the fall of Rome, as you, as you mentioned, uh, they thought that they could go to Italy, and finally, with the uh, loss of temporal power of the Pope, they could convert the Italians. So entire missions arrived to Italy to convert the Italians, and that's a disaster, nobody converts. And so they think they can convert the Italians when they come here, and from the numbers you, you gave us, you know, thinking of the millions of millions of millions, and the investment that they made, also financial, the result is laughable. It's nothing. And the Catholic Church, as uh, Joe remembered, the, the effort to keep them in the fold, they tried, and some of them tried in good faith, and some of them did good things, like Scalabrini, that was just canonized last week. Yes. Um, but the, the idea that they, the solution they come up with is the national parish, is somehow a defeat of the very idea of Catholicism. Like they're not able to bring together Irish and Italians, let alone Africans and Asians. Uh, it's a defeat of the idea of Catholic that means universal. So th from that point of view, I think it's a history of the defeats of the institutions and of the survival ability of Italians and of other immigrants because they managed to find their own way, to negotiate their own way, to be who they are and who they want to be. It is indeed a, a history of defeats. The Italian immigrants did not respond as any of the major religious players wanted them to respond. They did not, they did not attend church as uh, the Rome wanted them to attend. Many Italian immigrants would just postpone attending churches uh, or getting married or so much more to their comeback to Italy. So Ita Italians somehow lost part of their religious practice in the US. Ita Italians, the majority of them, did not convert to Protestantism. Uh, Italians, some of them, will, get, will uh, get radicalized in terms of politics. We know there is a, 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 um, a notable history of Italian radicalism in America, but still they didn't succeed in 
uh, in making America socialist or anarchist. So yeah, it is a history of defeats. It's a history of monumental projects that were not fulfilled. Um, but if I may, I may add just this to your your note, uh, Stefano, and to someone else who was making a case about the percentage. History has a complexity that is worth discovering, is worth highlight, highlighting, because we are not, because first of all, it is interesting to know the whole story, not the story of the majority, and also to, to, um, to, um, to read, also to rediscuss, to be able to uh, deconstruct the stereotypes we have about the major narrative, we have to start from minoritarian stories, okay? We can't say this is the, we can't say this is the 51% of the story if you don't know the 49%. So what I'm saying is not just interesting because it highlights something we didn't know, something it was a history of minority, minority, minoritarian groups, but also because it gives us, it gives us a more complete understanding of the whole religious history. Because as, as I was trying to make the case, Italian Catholics, Italian Protestants, anarchist socialists, they all live the same neighborhoods. They are related to each other. So you can't take a few elements out of this story and make a, a stereotype. You can do that, of course. This is what we do. As, but you can't honestly do that if we, you really want to uh, make a, an, an exact portrait of the story. Massimo, the, the Waldensians are a case in and of themselves because they emigrate, and of course they've been Protestant since before the, the Reformation, since the 13th century. And, and there is a, a, a group of them that comes from the, to the US as a group, and they move as a group and they establish their own community. So it's a completely different story. Absolutely. Uh, well, so not only ta some Italians get converted to Protestantism in the US, but there are some Italian Protestants who emigrate to US, Methodists, Valdensians especially. Uh, Valdensians, they uh, are accepted very well within the ranks of the Presbyterian Church, and they easily ac assimilate. Uh, and so they, you, somehow we lose track of their presence in, for example, in 1910, 1920s, because at this point they are just counted as Presbyterians. But, but yes, em Valdensians emigrate, some Methodists emigrate uh, as well. So there is a, which is another, another story that has not been uh, told. So the, em the immigration, who immigrates is not the, uh, the, the peasant from the, the Catholic peasant from the south. It is also Valdensians from the Valdensians Valley near Turin, absolutely. Mm, I had two questions. My first question was similar, so was just the reaction of the Pope to all these conversions, but you already said. So I luckily I had another comment, <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, I was thinking more general about the immigrant who comes in another country and has this shock of, and has to manage uh, somehow um, a sort of personal evolution which can come to a conversion, a religion, a religious conversion. And I'm thinking if you can, you can make maybe um, a metaphor with mm, present days. If you can say that this, this story that you told us can relate somehow to what the things that are happening now, for example, in Italy, with migrants coming with a different religion and how they will manage the integration in terms of religion and freedom of religion in a country which, I mean, is still very, very, very <laughs> Catholic, we can say, for the majority. But again, in, you're right, but again, it's, it's Catholic because it's politically Catholic, yeah. because church, many churches are empty, but the Pope is in, on, on, the, on the news in TV every, every day, the, 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 the politicians go to see the Pope, the bishops are present at the funerals, but churches are empty. So it's, it's not a, a matter of the, um, of the how, it's not a matter of the content of the religious culture of a country, it's not that, is, is, is Italy still a Catholic country, not because there is that religious practice that we would, that many Americans would would assume, would think they would find, but it, because the political system is still 
uh, imbued with uh, uh, the, the history of the penetration of the Catholic of Catholicism into liberal institutions. And uh, anyway, this story, of course, somehow, if you extrapolate the uh, the historic context, uh, the the historical uh, players, this is a story that happens. In, I would say many different ways because then. Uh, uh, I don't think it repeats itself this way, but it somehow happens also today. And so there are people who come from countries where there is a confessional order, where there is a church, a, 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 a state-established church, where there is a political church, where there is a real confessional monopoly. So they come from a confessional order, and can be Iran, but it is an Islamic country, many countries where there is a majoritarian uh, political church, confession, religious institution, and they come to New York, which still today is the laboratory of religious tolerance. Okay. Um, so this story happens, it happens. And it is, it is um, what I would say, one of the reasons, generally speaking, many immigrants still practice their uh, their religious faith with it is because they find, generally speaking, we are making of course generalization. Um, in America, still a country based on that First Amendment to the Constitution with a strong uh, culture of religious tolerance, uh, and so it is it is not for granted for many religious minorities the idea that you can come to New York and if you have some some money you can open a chapel a a temporary building, and you can have your liturgy, your service. In it Italy has has had, you, especially during the 90s and early to, uh, 2000, difficulty, for example, in granting space to uh, to um, um, mosques and to Muslim communities. Okay, New York, America, and Germany instead has a strong uh, experience political system and set of laws that allow people to freely, to freely live their religious uh, practice, experience, without asking for permission. This is really the, the thing. There is a right, there is an amendment, there is a set of, set of provisions which grant you the right to, be, to live your own religious life without asking for permission to the prefect, to uh, the mayor, uh, without having to make an intesa, which is a formal agreement with the state, as in Italy. This is a strength. Does, it, does this mean that today every single immigrant come to uh, New York and still and New York is, in these idealistic terms, the land of the free of free religious? Of course, there are so many cases where this narrative would, would, would be wrong. But I think still today is one of the attractions of America, the American constitutional order, but especially of New York, where, where the city is always changing, is moving, and people do not have social control of the territory. So if I live in a neighborhood and it, it, there is a, a there is a incoming community from a, I can't some it would be even hard for me to maybe to to know it because it's New York. It's busy, it's moving, it has always been like this and it it somehow grants privacy. Somehow grants privacy. But again as I say you you are asking for some thoughts on, on on today. I I did my best but of course the risk is to make silly generalizations. Absolutely. The point was specifically also about Italy and of sort of incoming Muslims oh. to there where, I mean, I think, and this is what I think what Stefano was saying before about the importance of studying Italian American history and, and culture is specifically important for Italians who seem to not either, not even know it, not even be interested in knowing it. So that to her point, um, Muslims coming to Italy are, you know, not given that kind of preference that we see that you've talked about here in the United States, and becomes a real flashpoint in terms of the way in which new immigrants are treated and 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 how their religion is practiced, viewed upon, or um, uh, lived. And I think it was a great. Absolutely, point. yeah. Thank you for. So thank you, Massimo, for your intriguing and also uh, 
historically based uh, uh, speech. I appreciate that a lot. I think that we speak the same language, so for me it's easy to say that I understand the every part of your uh, speech. Uh, since I'm very interested, as you know, in uh, methodology, in uh, terminology, and for sure interdisciplinary, I would like to stress uh, some uh, concepts, uh, uh, some uh, uh, categories that you quoted, uh, because I think that it could be interesting for you and for us to continue the discussion and also exploring other paths uh, um, through which uh, re-narrate uh, and also re-exploring uh, this kind of history. Uh, first concept, uh, uh, you say the, the market of religion. I suggest uh, to using not only such a metaphor, but as a concept, a, a category, in order to try to look at the American religious experience, uh, such as a, a market. Neoliberalism, capitalism, choices, and possibility of freedom based on competition. Second concept, uh, um, you use minorities uh, and majority. I would like to suggest, if it's possible, to avoid to use minorities in our new narration against stereotypes. And so maybe minorized groups, but not minorities, in order not to polarize and to uh, also use with our words uh, this kind of polarization in uh, uh, narrating the history of uh, religion. Third concept, uh, I think that uh, it's a good example of uh, intersectionality. You spoke about migrants, uh, Italians, uh, who were not Americans, uh, who were not uh, Protestant, but the majority of them Catholics. Uh, so um, Italians and Catholics, two minorities. Uh, and I think that this sociological perspective of intersectionality is very fruitful for your kind of, uh, of study. Fourth concept, and I apologize for this uh, suggestion, I will, I will continue the discussion. Uh, I think that also uh, urban religion is very important. Why? In 1965, Harvey Cox, the theologian, uh, convinced all the world that uh, cities were secular. So no religion in the cities. Uh, decades after, Jose Casanova, Irene Becci, Marian Burkhardt convinced the world that religion uh, are were and are urban and cities are religious. So where is the truth? Nowhere. But uh, I would like to say that uh, New York as a city, it's uh, a laboratory, you say that is, but we also could take into consideration the outskirts uh, and uh, the landscape uh, outside the city, so the immigration outside the urban context, uh, and try to mobilize this uh, urban religion uh, category as a lens as a perspective in, uh, in our uh, narration and our historical analysis. So that's it, a suggestion and uh, just not remark, but uh, a, a way for uh, uh, give you the possibility to be more and more interdisciplinary that I think that is uh, your future. Thank you so much. Thank Massimo. you, Maria Chiara. This is a comment and a quick one, not a question. I was walking here and I passed the St. Vincent Hospital and I see Alfred Smith Memorial. Of course, Al Smith was the governor of New York who ran for president and the Republican candidate opposing him talked about rum, Romanism, and ruin. And of course, Al Smith lost that election. Just a point of histor yeah. American history. Massimo, thank you again very much for a very thank enlightening talk. I think our students are lucky to have you as a professor, and I think the importance of bringing to light uh, communities that have been neglected, forgotten, and not studied, and the work that you do is really in that direction. Thank you for doing it. Thank you.